Welcome to ACF Chefs Forum. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and culinary tips, which is exactly why we're excited to have experts here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the culinary industry. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today, today's webinar for a very exciting discussion on my favorite fruit, California figs. We know that you have questions and we want all of you to be a part of the discussion. So we'll be taking questions for the panel live during the webinar as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other chefs tuning in and the Q&A function to pose questions to today's speakers, which will be moderated from Chris from the California Fix team. All right, so let's keep that discussion going in the chat. I know some of you have already been telling us where you're tuning in from today. Um, and if you have not, please put that in the chat now. If you haven't unboxed your kit, please open box one. And at this time, I'll pass the presentation over to Carla. Thank you, Jackie. Appreciate it. Um, first of all, on behalf of the California Fig Team, welcome. And we appreciate the opportunity today to share our fig love with all of you. Um, I'm Carla Stockley, the CEO of the California Fig Industry for nearly 15 years. And joining me today is Tom Payne. Tom is our food technologist and global food expert. He has experience around the world. Tom has worked with the fig industry for over 30 plus years. Um, also joining us is Chef Robert Del Grande. Chef is a James Baird award-winning chef. Um, he's a pioneer of Southwestern cuisine um, located in Houston, Texas, and has a deep love for California figs. And that comes from early childhood when he grew up in California. Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Jackie said, if you haven't opened box one, please do so. We have these wonderful tasting trays and there's two of them. So you'll want to make certain those are out. And that's the fun part where we can do some excellent interactive tasting with Chef Del Grande and Tom Payne, food technologist. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about figs, of course, but why California figs? And then Tom will go into the fig ingredient forms specific to California. And then Robert will round this out with California figs and flavor as a system to help build those wonderful flavors in food service. So figs are trending. In fact, in 2018, we saw some very big fig momentum, including being named flavor of the year by Fermanich. Fig flavor products grew more than 80% during this time across all wide, a wide range of food categories worldwide. Figs are also full of health benefits. And according to Mentel, new products were on the rise containing fig and fig ingredients around the world for number one flavor, functionality, and nutrition as well. Then the pandemic hit. In 2020, when the pandemic hit, as we all know, consumers kind of shifted to shelf-stable items in the pantry, and California figs did fairly well during the pandemic. 54% of consumers were seeking out healthier food options. And I think if we're all honest with each other, many of us were seeking wine options as well to complement those wonderful foods that we placed in our pantry. 32% were snacking more, and 60% of Americans reported cooking at home, which was really forced to the closure of food service as an option to go out. Now, as we begin to move forward into that next phase of the pandemic, it's clear that consumers are ready to return to food service, to your operations, to enjoy what you prepare every day. Um, definitely the option of going out versus staying at home and doing it yourself. Um, people want to do that. And it's a wonderful opportunity for all of you to begin to grow your businesses again. For over a dozen years or more, I think we've all heard the word clean labels. Well, today to consumers, Research does show that clean labels mean a little bit more than what it did a dozen years ago. What it means is less ingredients, ingredients that they can pronounce, knowing their food source, where's it farmed, where's the grower, um, really understanding that component 
but also nothing artificial. They want natural products as an ingredient in their purchased foods, which gives an opportunity for products like California figs. In fact, California figs and figs, they do check all the boxes from gluten-free for celiacs to natural, no additives, tasty and convenient. Figs do check those boxes that consumers are looking for in product development items at the grocery store, but also many of you that menu these items, these are things, many of these you have to label on your food menus at restaurants. Just three to five fresh or dried figs is one serving of fruit. Figs are also an excellent source of dietary fiber and do contain more calcium per serving than milk. Figs also outrank most fruits when compared to iron, magnesium, and many more nutrients of concern. But why California? California is a place known and trusted around the world. 100% of dried and 98% of fresh figs are grown in California in the U.S., in the central San Joaquin Valley, Valley. The central San Joaquin Valley, for those of you that may have traveled out to California, is really also known for its nutrient dense soil. And soil nutrient dense is going to also provide the nutrient dense, the cultural practices that our growers are so committed to, to provide that quality product to ship, not just in the US, but around the world. Figs are also ripened and dried naturally on the tree to help maximize that sweetness. And think about that. You always see on the news, 110 degrees in Fresno, California, breaking records in the heat. Figs love that heat. They thrive. And that actually helps maximize that delicious dried sweetness that you find in California figs. Quality and food safety. California is known for its high quality and food safety requirements. Not only is it required by the state, the USDA, FDA, it's one of the highest priorities of our growers to ensure that highest quality fruit is produced and delivered around the world. They are passionate. We have third, fourth, fifth generation farmers that are committed to provide the quality that all of us as well as globally have come to expect from produce that is produced in the state of California. Many of them also have state-of-the-art equipment and sustainable growing practices and cultural practices for generations in their own farming practices. One that has really got, come to the forefront, it's you hear it on the news all the time, is water con conservation, which is critical for our state. We are in the worst possible drought in I don't know how many years, and our growers are making choices within their orchards, whether it's a fig orchard, an almond orchard, pistachio orchard, but they're looking at how efficient they can be with irrigation, and they take that very seriously, including drip irrigation, which goes to the state-of-the-art equipment for those sustainable growing practices and being good stewards of the land as we move forward. Globally, there are thousands of varieties of figs. I was fortunate enough to go to um, the Nas International Fig Symposium in Italy a few years ago, and over a thousand varieties of figs are produced globally. Well, in California, we have seven primary California varieties. They start with the Mission Fig, which is the dark skin flavored, dark skin, savory flavors, and that Mission Fig is dried and fresh. We have brown turkey figs, you'll see here in the middle with a beautiful dark rich color. Um, those are fresh only and they're very robust, almost like a Pinot Noir in flavor. The Cadota figs, which are light green skinned figs, have almost like a Riesling, very, very soft flavor and those are fresh and dried. We also have a Sierra fig, that's a newer variety Sierra figs have replaced the traditional Calamerna fig in California. Those are a delicious fresh and dried fig that you see in your grocery stores or in your food service businesses. 
The Tina fig, it's also a newer variety. It's light skinned. It's a smaller golden colored fig when dried and it is dried only. Tiger figs, which you can see on the bottom left hand of the screen here, we call it the pretty figs. The media influencers, the bloggers, and those folks that influence consumer behaviors, they definitely send emails during fresh season and ask for the pretty fig. That is, um, it's a fresh only, and it has a delicious raspberry or baby berry fruit forward flavor to it as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Payne to go into the California fig ingredient forms. Hello, everybody. I'm Tom Payne. I'm a food technologist. My background is in food science. I've been lucky enough in my career to have worked in 67 different countries. And I just want to say one of the secret weapons that I've had in market development has been pairing off with American ACF chefs we've taken overseas. So I just want to let you know that your skills and your organization is really valued everywhere. I'm going to talk a little bit about the big ingredients. But first of all, I wanted to tell you that right here in your box, there is a ingredient book, an ingredient handbook. So basically everything I talk about today will be in there. So that, that'll be good. And the other thing is that we do have a, what looks like a tasting menu. And all of the ingredients that I'm going to be talking about today are in little containers that you can put on to that or else just grab them as you go. It doesn't have to be that scientific. But first of all, I wanted to say that um, I'm going to go start in next, please. And this is the this is the the platform that we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to try to go directly from one to the other. And the next, please. Here's my template. This is the all of the single ingredients that I'm going to be talking about will be here on this. So what I'm going to do is show you, first of all, here on this is the dark mission fig. And what this is, this is a variety that came to California from Spain in the 1700s. It's our, it's our dark fig. It's, um, as you probably are aware, it is a inverted flower. It's really interesting. And this fig has a real distinctive flavor that's cherished all over the world. Although there are many, many varieties, this one's one that really seems to please culinarians. On the right, you see the golden figs. What you really need, need to know is that the dark mission comes from a purple fig. The goldens normally come from a green fig. The golden figs have a real distinctive flavor and a citrus flavor. I have a little a little story. I just got back from New Jersey, where South Jersey, where I went to a, a meeting of um, a food technologists, restaurateurs, manufacturers, and I put a pile of 250 fig samples out on the table to pass out, and they were gone in 15 minutes. The Italian Italian chefs, the bakers, and the other people in that area it just tells you that throughout the food industry, of um, the restaurant industry as well. If you have um, a, a background from the Mediterranean, figs are number one. The next thing I wanted to show you here, and also it's another New Jersey tidbit, is the on the right-hand corner, you'll see diced figs. Well, basically, these figs that, that we're using, everybody wants to use them, but we're always looking for convenience. The figs are diced just um, and chopped into pretty precise dimensions. And what they do with that is it's used often in baking on salad toppings and other different other different areas. When I was out there in Jersey, I ran into a panettone maker from Atlantic City, and he actually had people in his in his shop dicing figs, whole figs, and he was just amazed that he could actually buy these diced figs and put it into his products. So it just really worked out quite well. The next one over to the to the left. From there, I'm going to jump up there and I'm talk about the paste. And all of you and have had in the past, you've had had the Newtons, and those were those were everybody everybody loves them. You grow up with them. And um, but what I wanted to show you here that basically is a collection. It's a formula of different dried figs that are expertly made for the flavor dimen um, dimensions that that you have. And that's what 
I'm sort of leading up here to Robert and his flavor thing. But the fact is, is this fig paste has been used forever in, in, um, as a binder in products and in other different areas. What I learned from out th my trip out there to North Jersey or to South Jersey was there are manufacturers that are making tomato sauces, savory sauces, and they're using this paste as a flavor carrier, but also it makes a very, very synergistic flavor. And, it, and it's just a unique, pleasant uh, experience when you, when you have that. And right below it there on the bottom of the thing, you have the diced figs. I have the, uh, I'm sorry, it's called e-diced figs, extruded diced figs. What, what it was, is up with that is this paste is put into an extruder, second time for an extruder, and formed into precise, into precise bits that are, are used. And what's really interesting about that is that they can be flavored. And I never, I never thought about this, but a, a, a company, and another, another one of the contacts I made over in New Jersey was a company that did salted, salted fruits. And this one is called Linghi Mui. It's a, it's, it's the, they call it crack seed in Hawaii, but they were making, they were putting in salt. They were putting in curry and other different flavors into this thing, but it just shows you how versatile the, the fig is in that area. And finally, my favorite Jersey story, which Jersey is kind of kind of the, the hallmark of my, my 67 country career. Now I'm talking about Jersey is that this is a water extract of figs that is concentrated down to a 70 brick slave level. And it's really an interesting product if you smell it you'll you'll take start to think wow I've, I've had that before in some commercial sauces or in in other flavorings but what this what this is used it's it's a just a wonderful wonderful base for making making sauces for toppings and, and, and other things i had a really great jersey experience when i was there i ran into a guy named carmen he was a jersey he's a baker up there in in, in jersey city and he specializes in cookies italian cookies from the bari region of Italy. And his mother spends half a day each week taking figs and boiling them down into make a syrup. And Carmen just stood there and stared at this thing for about 10 minutes. And I gave him three of my samples to take home. And his mother immediately called back and was crying. It was incredible. It was, it was like a real interesting experience. But what we have from this whole thing is we have just a number of different areas that make figs really, really interesting as a, as a functional ingredient in your culinary applications. Next. Next. So they're unique. First of all, they're unique to the United States. I haven't seen a lot of these things elsewhere, but it's used as a colorant, a natural sweetener, a texture and mouthfeel. And you're going to see this a lot in this whole plant-based food um, area where people want to put in, they can flavor it and make it into plant-based bits and such. Low specific gravity, so you can put them into muffins and other different things. It's shelf stable. It can also be used in areas that you haven't even considered, like the like the e-dice work even in, in some of the dairy products and such. And specifications, they can be custom made. Well, one thing I really haven't focused on yet, but it is the very, very most important thing of this whole presentation is flavor. And that's, I'm sort of the, um, the startup of this, of this thing because the main event is coming up next and it's Robert Del Grande, who's just the expert on flavor. And somebody said he was a sharpshooter of flavor. And I, I agree, he can do things, but he's gonna take these different characteristics of these fig ingredients and make them into some products. But first of all, I skipped of one, skip one. So could you back it up for just one second, please? It's fig powder. And you can just see it right in the right-hand corner. But fig powder is where we take the whole fig and we dry it down to about 11% and mill it. And we're, here's the powder up in the upper right-hand corner. Sorry, it's really an important one to me. But what this is, and what I've talked to, to chefs, I didn't meet anybody out in Jersey who, who, told, who was familiar with it, but the chocolate companies, as you, as you know, water is an enemy of, of, of chocolates and, and pastry sometimes. So this powder is, is very low, about 5% moisture, and it works extremely well and delivers a power punch. Now back to flavor again, and back and um, introducing my colleague, Robert, 
we always love to do, we're kind of on uh, different ends of the spectrum. I'm on, on the, the food science area and he's out there doing all these just incredible, great things with in the, in the culinary area and going after those flavors. Well, thank you very much and um, keep up the good work, ACF. Tom, thanks. Um, I think we're a good team together. We're always learning from each other. And, um, and even Carla, thanks for your presentation. Watching both of them, I always love to go through all those important facts about figs that are always so interesting, but also um, what I sometimes call the many facets of figs, the many sides, the many windows they have, directions that you could go. And every time I listen, I have to pick a pen because I have to make some notes. Carla mentioned the golden figs in Riesling. And for some time, I was just transported to Alsace. I was thinking, oh, Riesling, choucroute, cabbage, figs, braised pork. This could be Sunday dinner in the making already, all based on one comment about, about gold figs. Um, well, today I'm going to do the tasting part of the program, which I've uh, called California figs and flavor cinematography. Obviously a bit of a metaphor and uh, about flavor scenes, flavor characters, and us, the cooks, the chefs, the directors of those plays. So that's what we're going to try to do today. But first, I'd like to start off just um, with the, uh, some thoughts about the English language, which you know is like most languages, metaphorical, therefore a little vague. We can't be exactly precise with it, but you know we've all had that experience of uh, saying taste when we meant flavor and flavor when we meant taste. We kind of go back and, and forth and, and those words can have all sorts of meanings. He has great taste and so forth. Um, so I came across two questions that I, I just think is interesting that may sort of lead into this whole tasting. And the two questions are, and I know you've heard them, someone would say, what does this taste like, for example? Or if you tried, they may say, how does it taste? So on one part, it's like, what is it? And the other question is, how is it, right? So what is sort of the object? What is a fig? I think this is a fig. But what does it taste like is more, how does it taste? It's more of a less of a thing and more of a, of a process, a system, so to speak, of how our senses uh, work. So I'm always reminded that there's a difference, again, in the English language between uh, a reception and a perception, receptors and being perceptive. So they're two different things. One is sort of inputs, the receptors give us input from the environment, and perception, something happens in our mind that we have to put it all together. So if you just remember, receptors distill, they take the complexity of our experience and break it into parts, and then our mind puts it all back together, assembles it. So if you think just for a second, our visual sense, brilliant. The light comes in, we gather on our receptors, it goes to our brain, and then the brain assembles this three-dimensional picture with things in the foreground, the background, left and right, all put together by, by our minds. So very interesting that our minds are creating, sort of, it enjoys spatial dimensions, is how we find things. The same way if you think about the our hearing auditory sense, we collect these complex sounds, distill them into parts and our mind puts them back together into uh, a perception. So visually we create these visual scenes uh, from hearing, we create these uh, auditory scenes, things in the foreground, the background, how we find them and even if, if, they're, if they're moving. So um, it's funny that I think all our senses work the same way. One of the most intriguing parts about our senses is that they can focus on something. Uh, in hearing, for example, I'm, I'm sure you might have heard of the, I think it's called the cocktail party effect, where you could be in a cocktail party with everyone talking at the same time, and you can pick one conversation out of that whole group. Our senses can focus. So I'm thinking, ah, that's very important, very important in cooking, that uh, when they're out of focus, they fall in the background, or in focus, they, they become more present. So in terms of flavor, this flavor focus is an interesting uh, one. But then also what's interesting is they can combine. So we can put hearing and sight together, also audiovisual, which we're doing now, audiovisual, um, also called a movie, right? <laughs> Cinema, basically, that we can see, or see and hear things, and they're usually coupled together. I used to joke that you always knew when Darth Vader was going to enter the scene because there's just this sort of military music sort of playing. So you see how those go together. Um, so then if I were to, to use this phrase, the gastronomic sense, that like a visual sense, auditory, gastronomic sense, it's the most unique because it employs everything, all of our senses. And if we look at a California fig, for example, if you were to pick one up, 
the first thing you see is what you see, right? You see, oh, it's a, it's a pig. And you can look at it, it's very dark. It looks very rich and shiny. It looks delicious to me. So that's, I haven't done, tasted anything and I'm already making some conclusions. I assume that the gold fig is a different color. It must also be different too, just from a visual piece, right? So vision is very important in taste to begin with. Um, no one eats anything that doesn't look good. Oh, that looks delicious, we would say, right? So I pick the fig up and before I take a bite of it, almost all of us will take a breath before we bite into something. And so usually through our nose, so we, after seeing it, we gain the, the sense of the smell. If you smell the fig, it's, it's very delicate, but intriguing how many flavors are there at the same time before we bite in. It almost smells a little sweet, but it can't be sugar, not that volatile, right? But all those foresty scents, caramelized scents, before we even take a bite. So we have sort of sight and then we have smell. If you take a, a bite of it, no surprise, it's delicious because it looked delicious and it smelled delicious. And here you have all those taste receptors, which there are plenty of them, possibly more, but also texture is there, the, um, the feel of it on your, on your palate, um, which is very important to the texture, but also, um, You'll notice that the dry one is a little bit chewy, and I love chewy. Uh, and that really sort of comes from the motion of your of your jaw moving. So even that has a has a, something to do with the texture of the, of the fig. Then from there, um, the sight, the taste, the smell. I think you'll notice if you eat a fig, it has a sound. Those are the little seeds that are crunching in there. It's a very pleasant sound. A staccato sound. And that's also very important in how flavor, assembling flavor works. If you think about those words that we love, like crisp and or crunchy, you know, I'm not sure that their taste or smells as much as they're just purely sounds coordinating what we hear when we bite down on it. Uh, so that, that little crunch in the big sometimes gets overlooked, but it's quite interesting, I think. And then finally, um, Everything sort of accumulates in our mind, and now we have to put the whole picture together. So we're assembling these things. Uh, but our mind, great piece of work, by the way, um, will inject lots of things. So uh, uh, a sense of motion may be added to it. Um, the memories uh, can be added to it as well. Everything that's sort of um, happening in your mind. And if you think about when someone asks you that question, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite flavor? Generally, it's one that's coupled with a very positive memory. Mine, growing up in California with a fig tree in our backyard, I love those fig trees. So when I see a fig, it brings a lot of memories back. So your mind also is very important in it. And for the last reason that's important in our sense of cinematography is that I guess the best I can tell is that time gets created in our mind. So we end up creating this time dimension at the same time. So now we have this, these flavored scenes because our mind processes everything in dimensions. So we can move things around to flavors to the front, to the back, to the left, the right, high, low. Even we speak geometrically around flavor or sharp flavor, all that sense of motion is happening in that picture. And then because of how we assemble them in our mind, they move along. So there are pictures that are moving, which is cinematography, moving sort of pictures. In a way, that's how you want a dish to be. It has to be very, very dynamic as it, uh, as it goes. So today, um, what we'll try to do is think about, we have this great puzzle here. And by the way, I guess I can't uh, see you, so you can do whatever you want, right? You can just play around and go, don't have to follow me because I think your sense of imagination is the one that's most key here. I'll walk us through this, this tasting. And then we can sort of reflect along the way and maybe I'll jot down a few notes for a new dish. Uh, but here's one thing to think about that I always think about. I'll ask people, um, for example, uh, is roasted chicken with figs and fennel the same as roasted chicken with fennel and figs? They sound kind of the same, but they're not really the same. In one, the fig is the leading character first with fennel in the support role. And the next one is going to be, no, I want the fennel in the leading role and figs in the support role. So they're, they're sort of related a little bit foreground. Uh, background, just like if I said, I don't know, um, grill ribeye steak with roasted tomato and figs, very delicious by the way, uh, or grill ribeye with figs and tomatoes, 
One is going to lead more than the other. One's in a support role, one's in a lead role. Uh, then, of course, there's, well, ribeye steak with a steak sauce made from tomato and figs, which I would call a bracketed flavor. In other words, the two of them are sort of simultaneous, and they really sort of paint the whole scene. So even within the same ingredient, there's more than one thing going on that we can, we can adjust as we go. So, uh, and the way I like to think about it, sometimes you think about what's a good actor, right? A good actor is one that can portray lots of different personalities, right? Usually dependent on the director bringing those things out. So for now, I think metaphorically, we'll say California figs are a very good actor. They can play lots of different roles in lots of different dishes. And what we're gonna see now in this interactive tasting is how we can shape the character of that fig. We know what it tastes like on its own, which would, is what does a fig taste like, like a fig? I mean, that's the best I can do, it tastes like a fig. But now how can we manipulate those characters? So with, from your first box, we have all the ingredients. I've sort of laid them out here, just open them all up. And we'll go through tasting them. And you have the, the uh, dried mission figs and the gold figs, but we also have the nuggets and the pieces and the paste and some syrup and the powder. And you can use any one of them. You could mix them in a dish if you like for a combination. I usually start off with just a little piece of fig and I would just dip them in to see where it, where it goes. So if we start, which is always a good starting point for me, uh, I like to start with the universal applicable everywhere salt and pepper that we sometimes take for granted, but let's see what happens. So if you take a fig and dip it say into the sea salt and take a bite, you'll notice suddenly the fig is no longer sweet. It's now very sort of savory, almost meaty. And I think salt quite often uh, tends to push flavors towards the sea. Right? I think if we put enough sea salt on that fig, it would be sort of a vegetarian anchovy in a way because it has a lot of that umami sort of effect. So I can think about that. Oh, I don't have any anchovies. I'll use salted figs to get that sort of, but the main thing is you the shift from a character that's normally perceived as sweet and now is being perceived, and I say perceived because we're receiving different signals now, is now being more, uh, more savory. If you try the pepper, which again, I think if salt drives us more towards the sea, pepper drives us towards the land, more earthy. We try those two. Um, in both cases, you see the sweetness drop out and become more savory, although the sweetness against the pepper is a good balance. And you can see why I said <clears throat> um, figs with um, ribeye steak and black pepper are really, really good because it's almost like two ingredients. It's almost its own steak sauce on its own. So that's a good starting point to see this flavor shift between sweet and savory. If you keep going down the line, I have some olive oil here. So I started off with my three favorite things, salt, pepper, and olive oil. I could, I could cook anything with those three things. If you dip the fig in the olive oil, Again, whoop, there's this huge sort of savory um, shift. For some reason, the olive oil tastes more olive oil, like almost more olive-like. So again, you get this sort of sort of rich, I wouldn't say it's a highly focused flavor, but it's almost a canvas to paint other, other, other things on. So that's the oil one. But then the last one next to it is the vinegar, which you can dip it in. And as I said, if you take a breath before you take a bite, Vinegar is much more volatile, although the pepper is pretty volatile too. You get the smell of the vinegar. And then here again, suddenly we're in the sweet and sour kind of mode, which way should it go? Um, but makes it what I would call, if you want a lively character, add vinegar, it makes things move around quite a bit. So just in those four basic things, and you can go back and combine salt and pepper, salt and pepper, olive oil, salt, pepper, olive oil, vinegar, there's probably, I would say unlimited number of dishes in, in just in that category alone. But you can see on your palate, the, the fullest oil, the, the more contracted vinegar, the aromatic pepper, the salty quality. So right in there alone, I think it's very interesting to see how I can have a fig with four different characters from the same fig just by manipulating. So if we keep going down the track, this is the fun one. The next one is uh, fennel seeds and definitely known to be aromatic. And as I said about that gastronomic sense has a spatial dimension to it. We say it has a very high, when we smell things more like fennel seeds, you've got these aromas, ooh, like boom, all your sinuses. 
tastes like a little pork sausage almost, I think, meaty and fennel. The fennel, a different type of sweetness, same, but sort of activates your, your sinuses and your smell or your focus. You're a little more focused now on the smell. The fig itself is more aromatic. So I want to make the fig more aromatic as a director. I want more aromatic. I'm going to add maybe some fennel seeds to it. Um, then if you keep going down the line, uh, next to it is tomato paste, which is a, a great combination with, with figs. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so that's one where you're caught between the, the fig making tomato flavor even bigger and more sort of robust and full, or maybe the, the tomatoes making the fig more savory. So there's again, probably 101 dishes right in that combination alone when you think about things made with tomato and how you can modify that tomato piece a little bit. Again, you get that tail end of that yuami thing happening, something to build on. Again, it's almost like you have a lead, uh, lead character, you have a secondary character, or you have just a whole stage, like a platform that you can sort of work from. Um, to keep going, and so now we're kind of moving down a number of savory things. So I'm really looking at fig on, on savory applications, uh, as they would say at the Academy, either in a leading role or supporting role or all the other awards that they give. The next one along, if you keep going down the line, is garlic. It's a little garlic paste. Um, garlic, now one of those amazing things, whether it's raw or cooked or in a paste. Here, when you add it to the figs, you see another sort of shift. Now it's, um, I don't think there's a word for that flavor, but it seems like this roasted garlic that's even sweeter, even fuller, and again, sort of a broad canvas that you can build other, other flavors on. So we don't tend to associate fruit with garlic very much. On the first thing, oh, let's have fruit and garlic. But in this case, you see that that's probably the foundation of a sauce right there. Could be in a vinaigrette, could be in a steak sauce, barbecue sauce, so forth. Those are foundational ones that just add more, uh, again, when I say dimension, just a broader bottom to it. Um, if you go to the next one, um, I have another question for you, which is when it comes to taste and flavor. When I was a kid, I heard this. I didn't like something. And my mother would say, oh, that's an acquired taste. And so I'm thinking, so I don't like it now, but later on, I'm gonna like it, I guess, along the way. So you see that taste has to be not in your palate. It must be in your mind what you associate with it. So I will always notice that some people love anchovies, some people don't like anchovies. And I said, oh, well, it's an acquired taste but one that depending on the amount of it that you have can make a big difference. So if you, if you dip the fig, say in a little bit of anchovy paste, it's gonna taste one way with a little bit, what I would call a sort of a subconscious flavor. It's not really up in front of you or a lot of it. So if you try it, these are one where the, the volume of the ingredient do make a difference. So try a little of that one because I'm just so fascinated with, well, I love anchovies, but That's where you get this, which way should we go? I've made this with uh, a little bit of the big syrup and garlic and the anchovy paste and garlic paste and rubbed them on a, a roast and roasted it. That stands like a steak sauce, kind of crusty on the outside. At the same time with fish, it can be really quite, quite interesting. But it's a big blast of flavor. It's a louder flavor. Um, but I think it's really intriguing. Next, we'll go into some powders next. Um, and here's where you can really sort of use your imagination because the number of directions are going everywhere. The first one is um, chili powder and ancho powder. And if you smell it again before you take a bite, you'll notice that the shape of the aroma alone has changed. It offers, you still get the fig, but now there's this chili sense. And now we get a little bit of spice. That could be a lot or a little. And figs handle spice beautifully because they have that sort of sweetness and that acidity to it, and plus that textural thing. So there again, immediately you think of, perhaps I can make a, a Mexican style sauce, which we do quite often. And chilies always love a little bit of sweetness. You add that fig to it, I can make the color richer, certainly. Or if I use a lighter fig, I don't get as much color, but I get those aromatics of, because chilies have a very fruit 
flavor to them. It sometimes get masked by the amount of spice. It depends. So if you think about that, I want to bring up the fruity quality of the chili. I can add a little bit of fig to it. And that's how, again, I can shape that scene somewhat. The next one is uh, smoked paprika for two reasons. One, just to see how the smoky thing sort of handles. Uh, a grill fig tends to be more smoky. I might want to get that without having it. If you try the smoked paprika, again, just before you take a bite, you can smell the smoke. Very interesting. And I think I always see sort of images of Spain at this point, but it would seem like there could be a good number of dishes in there that might be, might be interesting. Now, all along, since we're sort of at the midpoint here, we're just doing what I would call a flavor interval, like one thing is a musical sort of term. How does one thing harmonize with the second thing? So these are just single ones. Then the third one gives you the chord. The fourth one makes it more and more interesting. So along the way, and you can sort of after the show have plenty of time to go and begin to combine them together because that's where the art really happens, how we build out that scene with all the different aspects to it. And since I used a musical metaphor there, then how we can add some sound to it. So it's a, it's a flavor scene that has both visuals and sound and so forth. So that one, I think the paprika is, is, is really good. And also even switching up the figs, going with, I'm just using the missions, but if you go to the, the gold figs, you get another sort of effect. Um, now the next one is in the list is cocoa. I put these together because, not because you hear moly sauce has chocolate in it, but Cocoa, cocoa nibs, they do have an interesting flavor with peppers. They sort of give you a little bit of a broader note to the bottom. So if you try the cocoa, and of course, we tend to think of it as being sweet, but cocoa powder is not very sweet. And here the fig is going to lend the sweetness to it, but at the same time back, it, the sweetness will go away. Um, now, if you get the right amount of cocoa, this is a brand new flavor. I'm not sure it's fig or chocolate or what it is, but I use this in roasted meats too, where either the fig powder or the figs in a paste, which is cocoa fig thing, you rub the outside. It has a little, if you were to add a touch of pepper, you get this prime rib thing. It's like, just like the crusty outside on the prime rib. So the, I was saying that when I first did it, they said, yeah, it tastes like prime rib. I said, yeah, and we don't need the whole prime rib. We can just get the crusty outside. So that's what I mean by when you think about a flavor. And again, not just the words, cocoa and fig. When I talked about the English language, those are sort of what identifiers. What is that? It's cocoa. What is that? It's black pepper. When you put them together, it could be more, how is that? In other words, how is that perception? It doesn't taste like fig or cocoa or black. It tastes like prime rib on the outside. So think about that a little bit just from the language game. It's not just putting the words together. It's really sort of directing the movie, so to speak. Uh, then we'll go to the next one, which is it's, uh, combined mushroom powder. This is kind of looking at those earthy, foresty scents, because uh, the fig dry fig already sort of has that. But I think it's sort of an interesting effect, almost a slight porcini sort of thing that sort of happens. But again, you're looking at, just say for example, that no greeting is, is perfect but every near perfect ingredient is looking for a partner to make it even more perfect. I think that one with the fig, a lot of dishes there could be very interesting, almost like uh, a vegetarian type pasta, but where the fig is adding the meaty quality to it. Like we say, a great vegetarian dishes, you don't even miss the meat or care because there's so much flavor there already. Uh, then if we keep going, um, years and years and years ago, now I, I became, I'm not sure if it's famous or notorious for, but for beef roasted with coffee, this is now 30 years old, but so I was, I love coffee, but I was always using coffee for almost everything. And we put some coffee here too, because again, it's sort of interesting that if you dip the fig in coffee, um, it's another case of coffee is two things. It's a base meat flavor with this high aromatics. And the fig sits right in the middle. So you get this very, again, beefy sort of quality to it where I know it's fig and I know it's coffee, but do the words go away to generate this new flavor? If you were to double back even and do a little cocoa with a little coffee together, you'll get another effect of 
them all blending into a sort of very rich flavor. One of the advantages of figs being very dark, if you need a sauce or something that has great color and very beefy, because we associate beef somehow, the steak has a dark crust on the outside, the roast is crusty. Those dark flavors, they trigger your eye first and the smell and you're thinking this is gonna be more beefy. So I think that's how, when you think about it, flavor picture, flavor scene, that can work very well. Um, then just to finish up, we have four left, just to, to show that, so to be creative is not to be crazy, it's just to be creative. But the first one, which I happen to love, so don't hurt my feelings and say you don't like it, is uh, powdered seaweed with figs. Um, I actually took this to Japan, Japan with Carla, we did a show with, seaweed and figs and everyone was like blown away. And I think it's because I couldn't put the words together, but the flavor going straight to the sea, kind of very interesting. The sort of fruity, salty sea thing. I think I made even a little paste out of it that was on the top of sea scallops, just enough to kind of almost give you, I sometimes call it the oyster one, the juice from a roid oyster effect, like you had hit in the face with this a wave, but it's not overpowering it, a little bit of that sense of allergy and fruit to it. But I love that one and it can combine well with other ones. Uh, from there, if you keep going the next one and these are fairly logical, following the seaweed particularly, a little touch of ginger, you can have it by itself or together. But ginger, you know, goes everywhere. It can be more Indian, it can be more Asian, it could be all over the place and even sit at a number of different levels. But Ginger and figs, and ginger is a very universal kind of flavor, but that one there, if you want the fig to sing, you add a little ginger. Everything sings with some more ginger. Kind of switching, so I'm, the, I'm on the movie score side now versus just the, just the cinematography side. But the ginger one, again, you notice, I think, the fig was sitting a little low on your palate, the ginger kind of moves it up. It's a little bit higher, it's a little more aromatic. Um, then let's see, the last two, uh, which is very logical. This is mustard, is mustard. So try that one, which I think is logical. Mustard fruits are really, really good. And it's not so much that they go together. It's that thing. What do they do and how they make, I think it makes it more round, more interesting, less of a big, more of a contributing sort of character to it. Mustard are always good. And the last one was just, I don't think it's too crazy but it's powdered kale, um, which is it's almost is interesting vegetable, but this is where I was thinking about a salad bar made from figs, like an actual bar that tasted like a salad. But here, the degree of that kale gives you all that vegetable quality. So I'm taking a fruit and moving it into the vegetable aisle and getting sort of interesting taste of green with the bitter and the sweet together. I thought it was fun. All this in the end, if you work back and forth, um, you can end up with products. And we've given you three that you can try. One is the, the nut bar, which is sort of a savory energy bar thing to show you how fig paste can work. The brownie, gluten-free brownie, one of Carla's favorites, is on the dessert side. So we're both savory and dessert. Uh, a little liquid one, you can try the barbecue sauce. Uh, I won't tell you what's in it because when you taste it, you can see it. It's all made from this, the fig sitting in the center. And uh, it could be a steak sauce. Again, anything that are in the liquid category of vinaigrettes. And then the final one is this little fig powder seasoning paste, which you can go back and combine more things with it as a dry rub for fish or steaks or chicken, add more coffee, add more cocoa. Again, it's really up to you to see what's your imagination. Uh, can do. So I think that's at least the start. Now you can go off and make your own movie. Um, think about Spielberg or, or Lucas or whatever. But so th there's where we are. So I always um, turn this part of the presentation back over to Carla. She's supposed to talk about the brownie, but she's eaten it all already because so I would normally say, Carla, look, I still have mine. So anyway, Carla, you want to say a last, few last words? <laughs> Thank you, Robert. I absolutely, you knocked it out of the park. I hope everyone had as much fun tasting as we did. Um, I was going to just do a quick, and I think the only thing we need to do here is 
making certain. Yep. Okay, I have something on the screen here that will actually and all of you will get the presentation as well um, from ACF. Uh, it's my contact information and Chris's for any comment or any questions further you might have. We have, I believe, about nine minutes. And so what I'd like to do at this moment is recognize Chris Caputo to join us. And I know during the chat and the Q&A, we've been answering them. But if there's any questions that may come up right now, you've got the experts here. Robert with the interactive tasting, Tom Food Technology, and I can answer any industry questions or we are happy to follow up afterwards. But again, thank you all today. Um, hope you love figs and got some of that fig love from us um, and that you're inspired. So Chris, are there any Q&A that you see that you'd like to um, bring out at this moment? Hey there, yes. Um, there are a couple of great questions and I think it um, it's beneficial for the group to hear the answers. I've hopefully responded to the ones that have come my way um, directly, but um, we had a great question about, um, this is for you, Carla, the difference between um, why some figs are grown for fresh and why some for dried. Um, I used a, a grape analogy where, where we have some grapes that are grown for wine, for table grapes or raisins. And um, I believe figs are similar. They're um, different varieties are grown for different kind of end uses, but would love for you to elaborate. So I saw your answer and I should have said spot on. Um, absolutely. There are varieties that are wonderful for fresh only. And then there's varieties that can be fresh um, and then dried um, beautifully into a dried fig. And it's all about the composition or characteristics of that variety. Um, we're also something that the fig industry is currently working on, and we could be years out from that, is trying to create a fresh frozen variety. So when you think of strawberries and some of the other frozen produce that you have available to you, um, those are specific fresh varieties, and they're not the ones that you're going to fi find as a dried ingredient or fresh in produce, but they're specific to the frozen and they have all the characteristics. And Tom, I don't know if you want to add something to that, but you're the expert in some of the other commodities you work with, with ingredient fresh and frozen. There's a whole new um, field out there of um, doing things like freeze drying and micro dry and all these other different ingredients that have been driven by the markets itself. In fact, um, we're even marketing powder right now into the pet food category. And um, so we're just getting started. We're trying to find any little niche that we can find and, and to better the better return and in, in the future for the fig growers. Thank you. Awesome. We had another good question um, related to the environment um, where figs are best grown. Um, I did a, a reminder, our, our figs here in California, 100% um, that are grown commercially in the U.S. are from California. So the California sunshine is, uh, is where they thrive. But um, anything to add further there, Carla, in terms of uh, the growing conditions that are best for figs? Um, I think you nailed it. Um, growing conditions, the hot nutrient dense soil in California. However, those I'm looking in the chat as well. And I love all the comments. Some of you folks from Texas, um, there are varieties that do well in Texas for fresh figs because your humidity would prevent those figs to really dry commercially. Um, Birmingham and then Atlanta, there are some pockets of figs that are grown commercially for the local farmer's market and those most often are fresh. So the dried climate is ideal for fresh and dried. Some of these other producing states are really more local, but they may go within the state and those are gonna be more conducive to fresh, mostly due to the humid climate in those states. So I don't know if I muddied the waters or not, but I don't wanna say that you can only buy them in California. Hey, Carla, I have, a, I have a fig tree in my backyard. I grow them for the squirrels. I love them. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> it's, the battle. it's the battle with us. 
Uh, well, the other um, more comments just to our speakers, um, we are getting many, many accolades and we appreciate all of you participating and giving us this immediate feedback, but um, sp chef specifically, um, everybody very much enjoyed the the uh, tasting exercise. And I wanted to point out, um, Leonard Rubin said, uh, greetings Chef Del Grande. We did a dinner together at Windows in the Green at the Phoenician during the Grand Prix in Phoenix in 1990. So thought you'd like to hear that Leonard said hello. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so excellent. Um, everybody um, reconnecting through the love of figs. Um, we appreciate that. And there's definite love for the fig brownie. We're hearing that loud and clear um, and already communicating with Jackie. She's going to um, share with you all the recipes that were in there. So the fig bar, the fig brownie, the barbecue sauce and the rub. Um, those are gonna be shared with you following this presentation. And if there's anything else that we can provide more tasting ingredients, um, we look forward to working with you all. And again, our sincerest thanks for joining us with this hour presentation and sincerest thanks to our presenters. Um, we are thrilled to be here and again, look forward to working with you. Chris, I'm also seeing, I'm gonna just jump in really quickly. There are a couple questions about not seeing these products in, in, in stores. So kit number two or box number two has larger samples for all of you to sample those and see what you like in your menu development or food development. Um, please contact Chris or I. What we would love to do is put you in touch if there's something specific you like. We can send larger samples from my office or we can put you in touch with one of our processors to buy direct. Um, but, but the ingredient side is, is trade ingredient, and that would not be available to consumers. Only the whole figs are available to consumers. And with that, should we hand it back to you, Jackie? <laughs> sure. Well, wow. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers today. A big virtual round of applause. I mean, that was such an interesting and delicious session. I know that I learned so much and I know the chefs did as well. So thank you so much, California Figs. Uh, and chefs who are tuning in today, uh, please be on the lookout for a survey that you'll receive within the next day or two, which we'll need you to compete, complete in order to earn your one hour of ACF CEH. We'll also include the recipe link in there as well. And if you're able, please do come out to Texas and join us for the One Day Advanced Pastry Summit on May 14th in Dallas. You don't want to miss a great opportunity to learn from some top-notch pastry leaders and see some great demonstrations, as well as to earn your specialized certificate in advanced pastry. Please visit acfchefs.org and click on the events tab to register now for ACF summits and also to register for ACF National Convention, which will be in Las Vegas July 25th to the 28th at Caesars Forum. We certainly hope to see you there. So on behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you, of course, again to California Figs, and thank you to the speakers for taking your time out of your busy schedules to share your insights. We appreciate you all tuning in today, and we'll see you real soon. Thank you.